this book by Andrew Harvey, where you see uh, on, the, on the, the table of contents, these are pieces of scripture from each of these traditions. That's what he's doing. He's doing the mystical scriptures from each of these traditions. That's what's in the book. And he writes, I believe, I, it's been a long time since I've looked at it, but I think he writes a little commentary at the beginning. Though he is also, he's a former Oxford professor. I, th I think he's done being a professor. But uh, anyway, the, con the question came up, um, what do we think about this? And so I just thought I'd give you another book. So this, this man is a professor of theology at Boston University. He wrote the book, God is Not One, the Eight uh, Rival Religions. He knows he calls them rival. The Eight Rival Religions that Run the World uh, and Why Their Differences Matter. And what he's talking about is maybe a little bit deeper cut into it where he's, as a theologian, uh, characterizing the world's religions and say they are different paths that lead to different places. You might also note here that where uh, Christianity in the last book was the way uh, was love in action, which is how Christianity was characterized, and here he characterizes it as the way of salvation. So it just goes to show you that these, uh, these world religions aren't necessarily easily, easily summarized. Okay? Next, cleaning up the mess from last week. <laughs> I'm going to spend all this week cleaning up last week, uh, uh, and that is after class, uh, Kathy was like, oh my gosh, I'm stressed out uh, in class here. I never want you to be stressed, Kathy. It's really important to me that you don't be stressed. Uh, and then someone else said to me in the hallway, you know, she wasn't the only one. Uh, and so I, I walked away going, wow, that was a disaster. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, so from the last class, uh, perhaps there were some that came away stressed. Uh, the spiritual disciplines were too hard, and the bar got set too high. Uh, okay, so I'll just tell you, that wasn't my intention. Uh, okay, so, so much for intention. So this week, I redid the slide. You ready? So we've got Jesus dying on the cross, and we've got, we've got Teresa of Avila in, uh, in uh, ecstasy, and that's the rest of us in the middle. Okay, what I'm trying to suggest is we live in the middle between being killed for our faithfulness and being in ecstasy. I mean, most of us, I just say we are ordinary people, right? We are, we, this is what we are, ready? This is what we are, we are ordinary human beings. And, and this stuff is for ordinary people, yeah. In case you were unclear about what you were when you walked in this morning, uh, 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 this is what you are. Uh, so, uh, what we're talking about here, this is a book, uh, Robert Bella was the lead author of this book about 25 or 30 years ago. This is a great book in its day. But I always love the title. Robert Bella, uh, I don't know if he's still alive, and it was an Episcopalian or is an Episcopalian, and he wrote uh, incredibly about uh, habits in the United States. And what we're talking about here are really habits of the heart. And uh, these habits of the heart are really habits of love. That's, that's kind of what we're talking about, right? And I'll just say that uh, habits... Our big, that's, this is big business in literature. Remember this book uh, written by Stephen Covey? Uh, that's an excellent book. That's a, I, how many of you actually read this book or did some of this book? Yeah, that's uh, more than 50%. It's pretty cool. And Stephen Covey is a very faithful Mormon, as you probably know. Uh, this is, this was two years ago. My sister-in-law walked around on summer vacation. Anybody read this book? Okay, so not as many New York Times bestseller. Uh, my sister-in-law read it on summer vacation, so I heard all about it from her. Uh, I never read it. But anyway, um, why we do what we do in life and how that forms what we, what we do. So what we're really talking about here are our holy habits. Now, I, I mean, I, are you completely clear how many habits you have in your life? Okay, your life is probably simply a collection of habits, right? So your ritual behavior in your life. I remember when I took uh, the um, uh, was class on ritual, uh, ritual behavior from uh, Aidan Kavanaugh in seminary, and he talked about how we ritually put ourselves together in the morning. So when you get up in the morning, take a look at how you put yourself together. You know, because we, we've been not together in bed and how we put ourselves together and the ritual behavior behind that. So basically we're just a bunch of habits uh, put together. And the question is, do we have holy habits to put us together in a holy way? And that is what uh, the boss, uh, Michael Curry, is calling us toward, is the development of holy habits that can keep our soul enlightened with the light of God. And, and he 
begins uh, his discussion, as you saw last week, with turning, right? The, the constant turning toward God. Conversion is the word turn, right? And that we might learn, which is what you're all, we're all gathered here to do, that we pray, which is what we're doing today, that we worship what we're doing today, that we live our life as a blessing. This is how we give of ourselves, of our time, talent, and treasure, that we go into the world uh, and do something about the faith that is in our heart, and finally, that we rest, Sabbath rest. So uh, this is the rule that is being presented uh, to the Episcopal Church, Worldwide Episcopal Church, and I think it's an excellent one. But I want you to know that all basic rules of life find, uh, their, find their growth out of this general root, the rule of St. Benedict, and a lot to say perhaps at another time about the rule of St. Benedict, Benedict being the father of Western monasticism. And Gregory the Great wrote down Benedict's rule, was the ordering of, of holy habits uh, in life uh, for originally small gatherings of what we would now call monastic uh, gatherings. Anyway, uh, and that is, as you heard me say before, the most uninspiring book of all time, uh, The Rule of St. Benedict. Uh, but it doesn't mean it's not full of incredible truths. But if you're looking to be inspired, um, the first seven chapters are the spiritual ones. And after that, it's what to do with the wine cellar, which, as it turns out, really matters. Uh, okay, so just so we're all on the same page, that we're ordinary human beings, we're all beginners, right? You know, we do not want to be beginners, uh, but let us be convinced of the fact that we will never be anything else but beginners all our life. Okay, I, I, I mean, there we go. So uh, we just, you know, with the difference between us and a lot of people is that we've just been beginning longer. <laughs> uh, and, and I don't know anybody in the spiritual life who isn't always starting all over again, uh, which leads to this great little book, uh, Always We Begin Again, The Benedictine Way of Living. You just have to keep beginning again. Uh, I think it tells one of the stories of a, someone asked a monk what he did. He said, well, I fall down, then I get up again. <laughs> then I fall down, then I get up again. So that's kind of the way it is with our spiritual lives, right? We fall down, and we get up again. I don't know anybody who's been perfect in their spiritual life, except for, uh, at least in, in the, not in the, I, I know no one is perfect, but um, in the outward keeping of their law, their way, I'd say Bishop Grine is the closest I know to somebody who was un unfailing in his, in his devotion to keeping his devotions. Now, the, um, uh, so that we do this so that we, we don't leave, live shallow lives. So, are you, I mean, you all clear how easy it is to be shallow? It's really, it's, you, we can be shallow like that. Uh, and it's really easy to be shallow because we're overwhelmed. And, and so we're so tired, we can just watch, we can just binge watch Netflix, um, which is actually really awesome. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily lead to deeper living unless you're watching a show that really stirs your soul, you know, and there are some of those. I mean, I, I was stirred by the crown uh, a week or two ago. I thought that was kind of cool. I don't know if the Lord cared that I watched the crown, but I was all in. Uh, and so uh, it's really easy to be shallow. It just is. And particularly since the world's so totally overwhelming. I mean, just read the newspaper and you've got to lie on the floor. Uh, so I uh, also want to say, and this is what my sermon's about today. So if you haven't been to church and I say a few things, you can maybe skip the 10 o'clock mass. Uh, the, uh, that we never talk about desire. I, I mean, we are so dumb. I just have to say that. We are just so dumb. We're so smart. We're dumb. Uh, we kind of like miss a lot of the drama. God is love, right? But we never talk about love in any of the terms that we care about, you know? We just, we just leave off all the sexy terms in church. So afraid of, so afraid of passion. Uh, and I just say that desire is like the one thing you need. Because if you have no desire, why would you do it? We don't do, we don't do, you know, I mean, we, we don't, none of us have desire to pay our taxes, right? But we pay our taxes out of duty. And some people really do God and church out of duty. But I got to tell you, 22.8% of the United States checked none when it came to religious affiliation, none of the above. And they don't feel the duty. Uh, and, and so, uh, but they do have desire, I will say. I would, uh, the, when the people say they're spiritual, not religious, it doesn't mean they don't have desire. And desire is the primary ingredient in the spiritual life. It's the one thing we need. Okay, if you want to make progress, you need to have that. Psalm 42, the first two verses are about that. Uh, okay, and then we're obviously, we're talking about an inward thing, right? We, we, we are so, I mean, 
We are such products of, the, 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 of grade school. I know, I know you all went to college, but we are some serious products of grade school. Uh, and, and somewhere along the line, or maybe through high school, we got the scientific method, and this is how you, you know, titration tubes and stuff like that. And, and we, you know, we, our education has been greatly influenced by the scientific method as, as the keeper of truth. And, uh, and it used to be the religious institutions in the world took care of many of the inward things, but that they have faded, that all religious institutions are in crisis. And we're, just, we're talking about an inward thing, right? We're talking about an interior thing that is uh, pretty hard to, to put into scientific method. And that, yeah? Wasn't there a book by the Bible, all the things I needed to learn in life, I learned in kindergarten? Yeah, uh, all the things I needed to know in life I learned in kindergarten. Anybody read that book? I heard it was good. Yeah, I heard it was good. I was like being kind, things like that. Share. Share. Wow, the world should really get a handle of that one. If we were kind and we shared, it might be a lot better. Uh, take a look at the world. Anyway, um, the, 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 you know, we're talking about inward realities, spiritual realities that, that would have been in the high Middle Ages, for instance, a reality that everybody assumed, but we don't live in a world where everybody assumes uh, the, the, the gifts of an inward spiritual reality. And, and they don't necessarily assume that intimacy with God is the goal of our lives. Okay, this is... Uh, I, I would say that, that we got kicked out of the Garden of Eden, right? That, you know, the story, we got, we got kicked out of intimacy. That's kind of what happens in the Garden of Eden. And now uh, the, the, the rest of the Bible and the rest of our lives, we're trying to get back in, uh, I think is one sort of theological way to think about this. We want to we wanna, we wanna be naked before our Lord and, uh, and to feel the love. And so uh, intimacy, and that's why we need to have language for intimacy, and we need to really work on our vocabulary. Now, the Bible does, uh, uh, the Bible talks about spiritual disciplines, but we don't get a lot of how-to in the Bible, right? And again, the, the Bible is a collection of books, but we don't have a book in the Bible in the, let me just, ooh, let me pull that back. We do not have a book in the New Testament that lays out how to do a lot of things. In the, uh, the, the, the book of Leviticus, for instance, does some of, the, uh, some of the pieces of the Torah do lay out in particularity how to do things, uh, how many cubits things should be and stuff like that. But we don't have, you know, you know, prayer and fasting and worship. These are things that are talked about, particularly in the Acts of the Apostles. You hear all this, all these spiritual disciplines being acted out in the Acts of the Apostles, but nowhere does the drama say, okay, so we fasted and this is how we did it. Right? And so um, we need now, as we go forward, to talk a little bit more about some of these disciplines. I remember when I started fasting, I, never, I, I thought, well, you just stop eating. <laughs> That's actually more complicated than that. Um, and, uh, and then I also, you'll hear about the ridiculous ways I fasted. This is totally dumb. Um, so we do need a little training in that. Now, uh, and also the question is, so what about, what about what we do versus what God does, right? And, and on the one hand, uh, if we just try to muscle our way to God, uh, how many of you tried that? I've tried that. I mean, I, I like, yeah, anybody try that? You know, like, man, I am going to take this holy hill. I am going to be so amazing in my disciplines that I will never, ever, ever not meditate for one hour a day. That lasts like about a week. Uh, and then, but what you find out is you simply can't do it. It's just, you just can't take the holy hill by yourself. And the other side of it is, well, I'm, with, I'm sitting around waiting to get struck by lightning. Paul got knocked off his horse. I'm sitting around waiting for that. I mean, I'm on my way to the grocery store. How come I didn't get knocked off my horse, right? Well, okay, that doesn't work either. I mean, periodically you hear that happens. Someone's driving on 95 in a traffic jam and like the heavens open and they, their life has changed. That does happen. But if you're counting on it, I wouldn't, I mean, I would I'd, 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 work, I'd, I'd buy a cheapo stock in the stock market and hope it goes up sooner, okay? So it's not likely. So we live in the in-between, right, Be besides of what we do and what God does. And I remember my, um, Rowan Greer, who I quote here, like my favorite professor in seminary, saying, uh, and this was, this was back in the old end days, and he used to say that if, uh, if you're single and you want to get married, you go to a bar and you sit there until may and maybe you'll meet somebody. Okay, this, this is now maybe totally politically incorrect, but uh, this was 30 years ago. And, and he said, that's what the prayer life is. It's like showing up where you might meet God, like going 
to the divine bar. And, and so there's some truth to that. So we are putting ourselves in the path of grace. That's what we're trying to do, right? And that, that uh, the very act of doing that does change it. So if you decide that you're, you, wanna be, you wanna be fit, but you sit around all day, it ain't gonna happen, right? But if you take on a discipline and you start at it and you just start walking and, you know, actually, if you do it for a while, it actually does add up. And that's the same thing with the spiritual disciplines. If you just kind of like get started, if you, if you're, you just kind of go at it a little bit, before you know it, you're kind of into it and you want it. And if you don't get it, you, you want to seek it. So it's, that's the habit of the heart thing and it does changes. But the big deal is that it's, it's the inner transformation. So we're doing outward things for an inner, inner result. And you can, you can do all the outward stuff and have no inner result. Okay, that's what Jesus is talking about with the, with the law of the Pharisees. The Pharisees get a really bad rap, okay? Would a one of us be as good as keeping the law, keeping our disciplines to the Pharisees? Not likely, right? Uh, I mean, Jesus hammers them. Of course, they're hammering him too, so they, uh, maybe, that's a whole other story. Anyway, um, but by, by doing these things, there are interior changes, but they're not instant, right? This is the sort of thing that happens over time. And, and when you, when you, per, you know, stay with it, this is what you find out is that, that Jesus, who is, you know, the Holy Comforter, who has promised to be with us in the power of the Spirit, actually begins to take over, okay? And that's when you do begin to experience uh, different sorts of things happening inside of you and in your life. So we might, an example of this is, we might say, well, what is meditation? So all, yeah, I mean, I have a jillion books on meditation, and, the, and there's a many, 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 there's so many different ways to meditate. But, but meditation, um, you know, its root, which is a worldwide, all world religions have meditation, uh, was to put ourselves, to prepare ourselves in, in silence for God, okay? And that, as the psalm says, uh, and you can now meditate on your blender. I mean, we use the word in a very different way. I want to I spot the wonders of my blender kind of thing. But meditation as a word is what we do. That's meditation. Contemplation is what God does. And so somewhere in meditation, by putting our, making ourselves available to God in silence, we get, God's, we, get, we get this beginning of the touch of the divine. And, and in the early going of that, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're glances, or there's a thing that Teresa calls the prayer of quiet. And the prayer of quiet is like crazy exciting. Um, and the prayer of quiet, you might be sitting in your in quiet. So in other words, you've really quieted yourself. You've just done enough of this quietude, so you you actually are quiet. And then you sense that that God is right here. So I don't. You ever remember when you took your driver's test? They had a peripheral vision thing, or you're a basketball player, and they want to see how far you can see with your peripheral vision. And they, you know, I can see, you can see, and see, and see, and see, and I can't see it. Well, just beyond that place where you can't see it is how you experience that the God is right behind you and is really present. And you just, you, it's so exciting. And you just want to hold your breath. And you don't want to think because it might go bloop. Uh, uh, and, and this would be a, a, an example of the, the movement of the spirit uh, that it, there would be the beginnings of so-called contemplation. The sense, that, the sense that God is real and God is really, really real E with you. And, and that, that in that quietude. So uh, that's where we start to begin to talk about that, that the spirit will be our guide, that if we just can develop the habit, uh, we'll, make some, we'll make some progress with all that. Now, uh, just to say finally uh, here before we talk, uh, our world is hungry for generally changed people, right? This quote, I love this quotation from Tolstoy. Everybody thinks of changing humanity and nobody thinks of changing himself or herself. Uh, let us be among those who believe that the inner transformation of our lives is a goal worthy of our best effort. So I, I tell you, you're all on the A team. I mean, you got out of bed to come here this morning. So in other words, you're with this. You're with it. You're like, okay, I'm going to give this a go. I'm going to give this my best effort. And one of the reasons we all live together in community is because it's really hard to give your best effort by yourself. And when people say they're spiritual, not religious. I always feel sorry for it because if you're dependent totally on your ability to give it your best effort. You know, and it's like everything else in our lives. Then we cheat ourselves. And when we do it in community, the community can carry us when we can't give our best effort. I, always, I, I made a little video about this after when I, I'm sure nobody saw it, but it was, uh, I went to church at the end of, the last Sunday of uh, 
my vacation, I think it's August 26, 8 o'clock in the morning, and I, it's a small summer chapel, and I stayed way in the back, and I, I knelt on the floor, and I, I just, I knew I was going back to work, and I was going to have to talk a lot. So I, I just didn't say anything, and I just let the congregation carry, carry me. And I felt like I was in the back of a boat, and, the, and all these other people in the front were rowing the boat. It was really beautiful. And I went up and received communion and came back, and a priest, a friend of mine, said hi to him and left. And, and that's, what the, that's, what, that's what religion offers you. You can get in the back of the boat uh, when you don't have the energy to be perfect, because none of us are perfect. Okay, so that's my preamble, and now you're on. Uh, 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 so I want to just, uh, the things I talked about or touched, and you know how to do this, so have at it. Is there anything on your heart or mind or your soul that you want to you bring up? Uh, so what I'll do, yeah, yeah. So when you when you speak, what I'll do is I'll just repeat the question. Yeah. How, when you talk about quiet, if it's important for quiet, um, is is it unique to really be quiet? And there's there like degrees of quiet. <laughs> uh, yeah, Nancy's comment. Uh, when you talk about quiet, does it really need to be quiet? And there are degrees of quiet. Uh, for sure. So what we might think of as quiet. So if you go into your house and it's usually loud and there's no sound in it, and you think, wow, this is quiet. Uh, uh, there, are, there are many, many degrees of quiet, inner, inner quiet, uh, what, what in the spiritual life is known as quietude. And, uh, and, and in, the, in the inquietude, what happens is the, um, the uh, ajida of our brains, of our psyches, of our bodies, begins to settle, kind of like if you uh, took a glass of um, dirty water and you shook up the dirty water and, uh, and then you put it and you just let it sit. And you'll see that uh, over time, you know, it, it might be muddied water and then over time they, they do separate and the, and the silt uh, settles at the bottom. And I would say that uh, is sort of like what quiet, how the, the method of quiet, but the prayer of quiet is is not just a thing that we're doing with our psyche, it's actually a prayer where uh, we begin to uh, it wordlessly experience the divine presence. So in the prayer of quiet, just to finish up on that, um, it becomes very, very hard to talk and, or to say the devotion that got you there. So if you always say, um, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee, if you're rattling through the rosary and you, you, you get into the prayer of quiet, you suddenly... You just, you, you can't say one of the prayers. The Lord takes away, the Lord takes away your, your desire to talk. It's almost as like the Lord, excuse my phrase, it's not a good phrase, but it's almost like the Lord says, just shut up, just be quiet. So I was just going to make a pitch for the Thursday morning meditation. There's a group of us who meet in the church at 9 o'clock on Thursday mornings for meditation, and it's a really lovely experience, and um, yeah, uh, thank you. Thanks for the pitch for Thursday morning at 9, the, the, the meditation group. So uh, there's a few things that we know about meditation. One is if you do it in a group, it's easier. And the other thing is if you do it in a group, you bond. Uh, the, the weird thing is that we might spend a weekend together talking with somebody or a group and feel a real communion with them at the end of the weekend. If you really want to feel communion with somebody, spend a weekend with somebody and don't say anything. <laughs> it's crazy. It doesn't make any sense, but the, the bond is way deeper. And so when we, when we meditate together, again, the group, the group energy can carry you while your brain is off doing your to-do list. My brain, I won't say it's your brain, my brain. I was interested in the chart you had about spiritual development growth that began with turning. Yeah. And, and then learning, and I think, in my experience, a lot of it had to do with learning first. Mm, yeah. And then, you understand? Yeah, so... I mean, I turned because I became part of a church community, but by learning, I think it became much more intimate. Uh, thank you for that, Charlene. So Charlene's talking about uh, the rhythm that is laid out here, turn and learn, and her experience of, of, of learning and after she had showed up, so to speak. You showed up and then you started to learn. 
And uh, thank you for that. You know, we live in a world where people don't just show up, so they, they oftentimes don't get a chance to get to learn. And uh, in particular, reflection upon, upon the Bible here. He's, it says in, I don't know if you can read, reflect on scripture uh, each day, especially on uh, Jesus's life and teaching. A lot to say about that, and we're gonna talk about that later, about this, this question of reflection on scripture. Scripture is the, the, you know, the word of God and the words of humans and the primary place that we can find. Uh, if, you, if, you're, if you're flailing or flagging in your, in your life of your spirit, that's the first place to go. Uh, and the, the foundation of your, of your spirit is to kind of learn from the Lord through the word of God. And it does work. It, it does. I wanted to ask you, I think you said the last time, I want to make sort of establish a habit. Aren't there some guidelines? Yeah, yeah. So... Yeah, the question of how long does it take to establish a habit? Uh, and that's what, in part, this book is about, is the establishment of habits and how long does it take. And the, I mean, there is a, there is a, a sensibility that that, that habit-making uh, takes 30 days. And then I, I scoffed at that, sorry, because I've had a lot of habits for 30 days that I lost uh, and then had to start again. But they say it takes at least 30 days to start to get into the groove. and I. I think we can all agree that after 30 days, we do begin to develop desires to keep a particular habit. There was another book, and I forget the name of the author, who published a number of books that essentially says if you want to become an expert at something, you need to spend 10,000 10, hours, yeah. in, which is the equivalent of you know, five years worth of commitment to that particular devotion that you write. Okay, that, okay, so now we're getting into, the, yeah, thank you for that comment, Suhair. So the, Suhair's comment is uh, the, somewhere somebody started this, but we all hold this as true, that if you want to be an expert, it's 10,000 hours, uh, which is somewhere near, he said five years. So five years, of how, I wonder what the, I wonder how many hours a day it takes you five years to get to 10,000 hours. If you're working regular shift. Oh, regular shift, okay, on your job, yeah. Yeah, I remember Bishop Grind saying in mass class that it took 10 years to learn how to be a priest uh, in a way that you didn't have to think about it. I was talking to Justin about this the other day, and at the time I thought, oh, we smoked 10 years. How about 10 months? Uh, but anyway, um, uh, so the 10,000 hours is a, fascinating, is a fascinating thing. So if you take a look at the, like, Yo-Yo Ma or the, the greatest of musicians and the number of hours they have spent with their instrument, no wonder they hug their instrument with great love. Uh, it, it's, it's shocking and staggering. And I, I do believe that, um, I, I, I do believe that the hours, the hours do matter. The hours do matter. And we're changed, we're simply changed by volume. Uh, I do believe that. But it's not a guarantee. So I'm just gonna tell you, there are many people who spent 10,000 hours in the spiritual life and became atheists. Okay, so, uh, there are monks that left it and said, you know what, that was then, I don't believe a word of it. There are, uh, we are, so we're just saying that we're talking about a thing that's very hard to put law around, you know, this question of spirit and the law. The, the spirit rules the day in, in the end. And, um, you know, I mean, yes, yes, 10,000 hours. But I can tell you, you can spend 10,000 hours at something. There's different types of 10,000 hours. There are 10,000 hours of all in, and there's 10,000 hours of doing time, too. Yes, Bill. I always wonder when, when we do these things, whether we do them out of love or out of duty. Oh, yeah. Is there a difference? <clears throat> love and duty the same thing? Man, I'm so glad you asked that. Bill asked about doing these things out of love or doing them out of duty, and are we doing the same thing? So, Bill, I actually think of you all the time. You never believe that, but it's true. Uh, because I know, I know you, and I know um, your naval training, and I know at the core of your being, you have a great sense of duty, and that the, the, um, the duties that you keep to your God and to your country and to your wife and to your family and to the things that you love, uh, even if you're not fully on board with everything, you, you have lived your life in a way with the deepest integrity and honor following your duty. Immersed oftentimes in love too. And uh, I do believe 
that one of the issues of duty is, is in this book. So uh, uh, Aidan Kavanaugh in that class uh, that I took um, about ritual behavior, this was a great theologian in his last class he ever taught, was just railing one day. And he said, he was railing on the Jesuits. <laughs> He's a Catholic priest, so he can rail on the Jesuits. Uh, and a former monk. And he said, you know, Ignatius, he's talking about Ignatius, and Ignatius had you check in on your feelings three times a day. And if you've ever been to, if you've ever been to uh, Fairfield University, the chapel they have at Fairfield University, there's an incredible sculpture of Ignatius, uh, a, a one-colored Ignatius leaning in and talking to another colored Ignatius. And the, the other colored Ignatius is his subconscious, and he's checking in with himself. And, and Aidan Kavanaugh said, he said, I don't like, I, I, I'm so sick and tired of feelings. Who cares about what you feel? Ignatius and his feelings, kind of like, poo. Uh, it's not about what you feel. He said, Benedict didn't care about how you felt. Nothing in the book is about how you feel. All he wants you to do is show up on time. Okay, so if you just, even if you don't feel like doing it in the Benedictine way, you just keep showing up. And so I do believe that there is a both and to, to love and duty, but I would also say that people who, who are wired uh, as Ignatius or wired as uh, Benedict, both of whom would be very, very different on the Myers-Briggs scale, uh, their prayer uh, remains the same because it has an inner quality of of, of um, relationship and, and how you characterize that relationship as duty or love, I would, I would purport that all those who follow their duties also love. They follow their duties because of love too and, and, and in your life too. So I, I do think that it's, it's, it's a both and. Uh, it's a both and. But, um. Going back to the way of love little diagram. Yeah. I've been thinking about fact that I think for me, worshiping in a community and being consistent about it has led me to want in my later years to want to learn more about what it is that we're doing. Yeah. And you know, taking classes and, and learning more about the Bible and what it actually says and whether it's metaphorical and Right, yeah. And learning how to pray. I mean, I, we always pray, but learning how to pray and what it means and how you do it and not feel bad if you're not really good at it. Yeah, yeah. So I think I started backwards a little bit. Yeah, that's a beautifully, beautifully said. Thanks. Robin was talking about her own life and how years in a worshiping community eventually led her to want to, uh, to learn uh, and to enter more deeply into some of the other things like, you know, the Bible or, or how to pray, and thank you for that. I think that that is, I mean, we, there are many doors to entry, right? And, and a lot of us uh, entered through particular doors and it didn't mean anything, and then suddenly it did. And this is a little bit of like, if you just get in the boat, you eventually end up someplace. And uh, the, the question of why do you suddenly decide, or why do you decide that I'm actually gonna, I'm actually gonna give this a go? I'm actually gonna pick up the Bible and figure out what the heck to do with this book. Or I'm, I'm actually gonna to try to learn how to pray. I think it's very interesting that, that uh, I mean, God, I don't know what you learned in your spiritual formation, and some of you learned more. I'm looking at you, Lauren, I'm, you know, the way you grew up, where I think you were probably learned more in your spiritual formation than some of us, but I don't remember uh, in my spiritual formation anybody saying to me, I'm going to teach you how to pray, for instance. Seems like a really basic thing, <laughs> just didn't come up, right? Uh, or I'm going to teach you how to pray with the Bible. Yeah, I didn't get that either, and, you know. Just and and I know certain evangelical households, uh, this would you would you would be memorizing you would be memorizing scripture pieces and doing all sorts of things. Um, but I'll just say again, these holy habits, whether or not they're formed young or formed old, are no guarantees. So many people of, of intense religious formation in which the intensity of religious formation is strangling, okay? So if they didn't have this, they had this. And so they, they went through their intense religious formation and they're like, oh, when I get to be an adult, I quit. 
uh, you know, they can't, they can't stand it because the life, the inner life of the spirit is like breathing. Remember, spirit comes from the word breath. And so God's movement in our life is like breathing. If you take your chest and put a belt around it, guess what? You can't breathe. You can breathe. You can only breathe in sh short ways. And that's how the spirit is. So the spirit needs to be able to go whew, whew, in our lives. And, and so this question of entering through the worship community and then suddenly you come on. Um, I won't say them now, but I have stories of people in our community who share for me just the most beautiful things that happen. I have many stories of people who were dragged to St. Mark's by their wives. <laughs> like, if you want to stay married, you got to come, uh, kind of thing. And, uh, and then they find that they stay, and she goes, and they're all in. And so you, you just never know. I mean, you never know how the spirit moves. Jesus says, you know where the wind comes from. It goes, it's the same, same thing with the spirit. Okay, so well, that's not summarizable. I'm just going to say that uh, Nancy's uh, saying that sometimes she has difficult praying by herself or meditating by herself when she comes to church and looks around. She's filled with the fullness of knowing that other people have made the choice to come there, that with somewhere within them, uh, the mysteries that they're, they're there to, to, you're sort of all together with the Lord. So um, back to the anthropology of human behavior, which was the name of the course that Aidan Kavanaugh taught. And, and he said to us, we didn't need to read and we didn't need to take notes. So I didn't read and I didn't take notes. And now I really regret I didn't take notes. Um, because he used a word, an anthropological word, and I, I cannot, I don't know what it is. Actually, I know the TA for the class. I should call him up. He's the Bishop of Dallas now. Uh, and he talked about what is it that we get out of a group experience? It just makes us plain old feel better. So it's a pain to come to church. But I can tell you, when people leave church, they feel good that they did it. And when they didn't, they feel a little depreciated. Something that they wanted didn't happen. And I, I don't have the word for it. And maybe that's a little bit of what you're, you're speaking about, Nancy. There, there is a goodness. There is a, there is a gracefulness. It's not good. There is a gracefulness that comes by being in the body. And this is, again, where it is caught and not taught. It doesn't matter if the sermon's good or bad. It doesn't matter if the sound system's on or off. Just somehow being together with a, with a communal desire to do things. Oh, do you know the word, Justin? I don't know that I know your word. Your kind calls it collective effervescence. Uh, okay, I'm going to say that out loud. Collective effervescence from Durkheim. You, any, oh, beautiful. That's it. That's just what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Really cool. Collective effervescence. I've never heard that. That's really cool. I believe that. And when we say in our, in our spiritual vitality initiative, we have two goals, and that is that each one of us uh, or the people coming through our stream experience a growth in the spirit, a deepening in their life, a, a closer communal touch, and that we would ex extend, the second being we would extend the, the, the reach beyond our current boundaries. We're talking about that effervescence, that we have a thing in our community. We just do. It's a treasure. It's a serious spiritual treasure, and I know there's many who would hunger for it if they knew about it, and if we could figure out how to tell them or convince them that they might, this invitation is worth taking up. Okay, the bell is tolling for me, for whom the bell tolls. God bless you. Thanks, everybody.